Hi, this is the Hungry Math Professor here, and welcome to my channel. And today I want to talk about Russell's paradox again, but in a different context. So if you haven't seen my video already on Russell's paradox, I would recommend that you check that out first. Even if you're familiar with Russell's paradox, um, check out that video. It's short, and there's a lot of history that you may not be aware of, which will be interesting in this particular video. And so why am I talking about Russell's paradox again, right? Well, here, I'm going to tell you the story now, and then I'll show you a second, second version of Russell's paradox towards the end of the video. So first of all, there's this philosophical question that we want to think a little bit about. So the question is, uh, what is a number, <laughs> right? So it's a simple question in some sense to state. Um, and we mean this in the philosophical sense. So, you know, um, can you give a, a, a Loctite sort of definition of what a number is, one, first of all, but also does that definition capture uh, what it actually is? Like to try to give a sense of, of what I mean, like oftentimes when we tell people, we try to teach kids what three is, right? We'll point to three apples maybe, or point to three pencils. Or we'll point to groupings of three things. And of course, we don't mean that three is those three objects exactly, right? We want the, eventually you want this kid to abstract away the concept of three as just a grouping of three things, right? Something like that. Um, but that means when you abstract it away, that means you're not talking about something in the physical world when you talk about three. And so it becomes natural to ask, then what is three? Is it just a product of our language, a useful story that we tell to describe things about the world? If that's the case, then, then mathematics doesn't seem maybe that solid. Is it just something, are numbers just something that follows once you get a certain number of axioms, then we can do, we can do implications from there and numbers follow from that. You know, all those kinds of answers seem very um, shaky. So maybe as mathematicians who believe our work is, is somehow solid and certain, uh, we might be drawn to say that, that numbers, you know, have some being of their own in some platonic realm or something like this, right? This is the question of whether uh, math is invented or discovered. If it's discovered, then that means that numbers somehow have some being, not in the physical world, but in some other place, right? And and uh, this is the kind of way we're asking this question. And I know oftentimes mathematicians don't like these kinds of questions because you feel, because we feel like you can't possibly give a solid answer to this. And I don't necessarily disagree with that um, feeling. I I'm not so sure we're ever going to completely answer this question, um, but I do think it's really interesting to survey like the potential answers people have given and the different approaches. I mean, we might not be able to pick one, um, you know, with any kind of certainty, but I think there are approaches which are logically consistent with themselves and are worth thinking about. So I'm going to present one answer to this question, which is really interesting uh, if it worked, but it turns out it doesn't. <laughs> Okay, so this was given by Frege. This answer was given by Frege in uh, his, his work called, this is translated into English, and it's called in English, The Foundations of Arithmetic. I mentioned it in the, um, the previous video on Russell's paradox. And that was published in 1884. And this is the one that did not necessarily have the the problem in it that Russell pointed out. And this gives an answer. Um, so Frege in this work gave an answer to this question of what is a number. Okay, and I'll present that answer in a second, but it's interesting to tell a little bit more of the story of the history first before I tell you what the answer is. But what I mean is he gives a very satisfying, I think even mathematicians are gonna be very satisfied by this definition of what a number is. And I'll, again, I'll get to it in a second. Uh, what's interesting, remember Russell um, points out the, um, what I'll call in this, again, because of what I said in the other video, I'll call the R Russell's or Mello paradox 
in uh, Frege's work in um, this was in 1903. Not in the not in the paper Foundations of Arithmetic, but this the other paper which I mem what I mentioned in the other video. So that was uh, Basic Laws of Ar Arithmetic, Volume Two, right? So, um, uh, Basic Laws of Arithmetic, Volume Two. Okay, what's interesting, though, is at the same time, Russell is working on his own book, and the book is called, uh, so this is a, so, okay, here's a fact here, fact, and now um, I want to say that uh, Russell is uh, writing a book entitled The Principles of Mathematics. And this is also... Um, first published in 1903. Apparently this is containing a lot of the work in Bertrand Russell's uh, dissertation. And he puts forth in this work, he puts forth the same definition which Frege gave in um, 1884. Of course, he, he knows that it's Frege's definition, so he, he attributes it to Frege, but he um, uses the same definition in his own work. Again, notice the time, because he points out the Russell paradox in Frege's work in 1903. At the same time, he's publishing Principles of Mathematics, and he's going to make actually the same mistake, uh, but it's a little bit disguised. Okay, so now I'm going to show you what that is. So he wants to define um, what number one is, for instance, right? He's just going to talk about the natural numbers. So one, two, three, four, so on and so forth. He's just going to define what one is and so on and so forth from there by saying, um, so the cardinal number, so cardinal number here is standing for what we're trying to define, something like one. So the cardinal number of a class, and I'll put this in quotes, is uh, the class of all classes similar to the given class. Okay, this is the definition that he gives. Now, uh, I'm gonna have to explain this because this feels like a tongue twister, like what the heck is he saying? Uh, so this is the same definition that Frege gave, maybe a slightly different wording, but uh, essentially the same definition. Let me state it in a slightly different way. Um, so I would say, for instance, one is the set of all sets um, which contain only one element. I switched to set because we tend to be more familiar with with uh, set as a word if you're not familiar with classes. Nowadays, we use sets as the word for um, describing things which are sets, meaning they are allowable in um, in like zermelo frankel set theory, for instance. And we use classes for like a notation of describing something which is not a set, so it's not allowable in the theory, but still can be used to like communicate uh, an idea. Uh, so anyway, we, we tend to use set and class in a slightly different way in the modern lingo, but at the time, um, they were also trying to figure out what these things should mean. But anyway, I'm going to say one is the set of all sets which contain only one element because it's not going to work anyway. So either way, it's going to have a problem. Um, and so what is the problem, right? So again, you know, three would then be is the set of all sets which contain three elements, right? So this is a very natural definition of number, though. I think if it did work out, I think mathematicians would be very happy with this definition, right? And it's also aligns with like how we teach kids to work with numbers, right? When I point to three apples and then three pears and then three pencils and three people or three books, whatever, 
and I want them to abstract away, what am I asking them to abstract away? I'm asking them to abstract away the idea that three is the set of all sets with three elements in it, aren't I? Isn't that what I'm asking them to do? I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily expect them to start talking about sets, but but it's a very natural definition, right? It's like, I, you know, I, I wish it worked because it would have been a, a beautiful uh, way of defining what a number is. Um, so what's the problem, right? I've, I've kind of waxed poetic about this. What's the issue? So here's the problem. So let's take one to be the set of all sets which contain only one element. And now I'm gonna define uh, another set, call it A. And it's gonna be the set of all sets that contain just Y. So that means it's a set containing just one element. Here, Y is an element. It could be a set, could be a thing, whatever. But as far as the number of elements in this set, there's only one and it's called Y. And it's Y has to be something which is a subset of one. So it's contained in the set of all sets, which only have one element. And I'm gonna use Russell's, we're gonna use Russell's idea against him here um, and against Frege again and say, well, Y has to be such that the set containing Y is not an element of the set Y. Okay, now I've written this down, but there's gonna be problems with this. So just because you can write a formula down doesn't mean it actually uh, is okay. And so what's the issue with this? Well, first of all, notice, so let me put this in red. This is gonna be the problem set, okay? And we're using um, we're using this, this uh, definition of one right here. Okay, so what's the what's the issue, right? So first of all, notice um, note that um, a by definition is a subset of one. Okay, right, because it's the set of all sets containing one element y, and also you're asking, well, that's all you need to know. So that's that's already why it has to be a subset of one. So the point is that a already satisfies the first condition um, of its of its own kind, right? So there's like two conditions, one and there's two. So what I'm saying is A already sa satisfies the first condition inside of its definition. And the thing is that it's going to, now you're gonna be able to play with the second condition because it's basically the regular Russell's paradox condition. So now I say, if the set containing A so again, let me just say the question now is, um, is the set containing A in A or not, right? That's the question. Well, if it is, there's only two possibilities. It either is or isn't, right? So if it is, then by definition, um, the set containing A it, uh, is not an element of A. And so that doesn't work. Okay, so let's try the other one. So if the set containing A is not an element of A, then, well, then by definition, this set containing A is an element of A. And so, of course, this these things combined give us a contradiction. And hence, the definition of one and all the other natural numbers that, that Russell gave following what Frege gave has the same Russell paradox, uh, the Russell's or Merlo paradox. And it's really interesting fact in history that Russell points out this paradox in Frege's work and then makes the exact same mistake in his own work. And I think this is a good, you know, a lesson from history that, you know, maybe all math students at the undergraduate and graduate level should, should be aware of. I think it's an interesting story because it, it points to, I mean, Russell is an extremely intelligent person. So is Frege. These are some titans of math, philosophy, and logic. And even though Russell pointed out the mistake in Frege's work, he makes it again. Of course, not exactly the same mistake. That would be really embarrassing, um, but it's very similar. And it just requires you to sort of extend the reasoning a little bit by defining this set A. Um, so it's just one of these good moments of humility in, you know, math is hard and it's, you know, it's very possible for even the best minds to make a subtle mistake. And, um, you know, oftentimes we learn from these mistakes, so they're not complete wastes of time. Of course, we should be careful and we shouldn't try to make these mistakes willy nilly or anything like that. But, you know, we should also be humble in the fact that these things happen, uh, even to some of the best people uh, in the fields.
And what's interesting, again, is that this issue in, in Russell's work was not discovered by Russell. It was actually discovered by Felix Hausdorff in uh, 1905. And so this is Hausdorff, the one who's famous for what well, I know his name for, for Hausdorff spaces and topology, uh, another big uh, name in mathematics. And he uh, discovered this issue in Russell's, in this definition, uh, in Frege's definition originally, and then repeated in Russell's work when he was reviewing the manuscript. So again, a very interesting story. Uh, I learned this story um, by reading um, this book by Ulrich Felgner that I, I've mentioned a few times and I've done a, build, uh, a video on. It's a very good book if you want to go back and really just study the history, starting all the way from ancient times and Plato and Aristotle, Euclid and things, all the way up to um, the modern 20th century developments. Okay, thanks. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe, and I hope to see you at another video.